Hello, I'm Amanda Thomas, and you are listening to A Scientist Walks Into a Bar, where you can hear recordings of talks given at Science on Tap, a series of events held in Portland, Oregon, and Vancouver, Washington. In this episode, we'll hear science writer and journalist Florence Williams talk about her book, The Nature Fix, Why Nature Makes Us Happier, Healthier, and More Creative. We recorded this event in Portland at the Alberta Rose Theater when she was there on her book tour in March 2018. She talks about how living in relentlessly urban settings can affect your cortisol, about forest bathing in Japan, some reasons why Finland is the happiest country in the world, and studies about how just a few minutes in nature can start relieving stress. Basically, it's scientific encouragement to get outside. Stick around at the end for several questions from the audience about things like adult recess, vitamin D, and whether it's possible to bring nature to the space station. Also, because it might be confusing otherwise, I should mention that we do trivia at the beginning of each event before the talk starts. One of the questions was about how the scent of hinoki tree is used to market lots of products in Japan, including hinoki-scented panty liners. So now you know those exist. Anyway, I'll include a link to where to find this book and more information about Florence in the episode description. With that, here we go. Let's welcome author Florence Williams to the stage. It's so great to be here. And the sun came out, which makes me really happy. I live in Washington, D.C. now, where there's not a lot of sun either. So I'm like, Portland is the sunny place. Um, Well, thank you, Amanda Thomas, and thank you, Science on Tap. It is so great to be here. Um, And and you guys are such a jolly crowd. I feel like I should serve alcohol at all my book talks. (laughs) And I know it's going to be hard to sit still tonight because you really want to run outside and buy those cypress-scented panty liners. (laughs) Okay, so I have a question for you. How many of you, as children, played outside every day? Wow, okay, that's Portland, way to go. You are a self-selecting crowd, I think. Um, But as you probably have heard, this is not really the case for children today. Children are not getting outside, and if they are, they are typically on sports teams, they have adult supervisors, they're running around on a monocrop of grass, or maybe even astroturf. Um, So times have changed. And in fact, I wanted to read a quote from the writer Michael Chabon. And that is, childhood is, or has been, or ought to be, the original great adventure, a tale of privation, courage, constant vigilance, danger, and sometimes calamity. But kids aren't having this adventure anymore. And increasingly, neither are adults. In fact, we are living in the middle of the largest mass migration in human history. And it's the migration to cities. And at the same time, it's the migration indoors. So my life actually reflects these trends, and that's part of what inspired me to write this book. I went from having a backyard that looked like this This is the Flatirons in Boulder, Colorado. I lived in Colorado or Montana for over two decades after college. Uh, And then I moved to having a backyard that looked like this in Washington, DC. So I went from feeling like I was almost connected to nature on an hourly basis uh, to living in the middle of a monochromatic, largely gray, noisy environment. And in fact, to get to my hiking trail, which I still try to go to every day, um, I have to scramble down a, a bridge embankment that's covered with graffiti. I have to clamber over this chain link fence and cross a freeway. And then once I get down there, and it's the CNO Canal Trail, which is actually a National Park Service unit. It's, it's very pretty. Once you're down there, it's close to the Potomac River. But it turns out it's under the flight path of Reagan National Airport. And so there are low-flying jets every 90 seconds. So I never knew that I was someone who was sensitive to noise pollution until I made this move. And it turns out actually about 15% of people are highly sensitive to noise pollution. 
Uh, and it's partly correlated to personality traits. So I'm not really proud of this, <laughs> but if you, if you tend to rate as slightly neurotic or more than slightly neurotic, you tend to be more annoyed by noise. <laughs> so I'm sorry to say, uh, <laughs> if you are annoyed by no noise, that might be what's going on. <laughs> and after I moved to Washington, D.C., uh, I really, I felt like the sort of cortisol bomb exploded in my brain. So I felt, I did, I felt more anxious. I felt um, depressed. I had trouble sleeping. Um, I would burst into tears in the traffic circles, <laughs> which I wasn't used to. And my kids were very concerned about me. Um, and I really started to wonder what the science had to say about how our external landscape is really reflected in our internal landscape. I wanted to know if what this, the journalist Richard Louvre has called nature deficit disorder you know, was real and what the science had to say about it. Um, because certainly we've known the old chestnuts for a long time about nature being restorative and a bomb for the soul, um, that it puts us um, closer to essential truths about ourselves. But it's really only been in the last 20 or so years that science has started to measure what's actually happening to our bodies physiologically, what's happening to our brains in these different environments. <clears throat> and in fact, um, this triad of psychologists from the University of Michigan in 2008 wrote, imagine a therapy that has no known side effects, was readily available, and could improve your cognitive functioning at zero cost. Such therapy has been known to philosophers, writers, and lay people alike interacting with nature. After I moved to DC, I was fortunate to get two magazine assignments in a row that really sent me all over the world to talk to researchers who were doing kind of the latest cutting edge research on these topics. And the way I do journalism is um, through the, well, I write about it in the first person voice, and I do what I call participatory journalism somewhat, which is that I kind of experiment on myself as a way to humanize some of the science and a way to talk about it. Um, so in this photo, I am actually testing my cortisol stress hormone levels, and here I'm wearing, or I'm um, on my finger, I have a heart rate variability monitor, which is another measure of how we respond to stress. And in the bottom photo, I'm wearing a portable EEG cap or electroencephalography cap. And I wore this kind of all over the place in different environments. I wore it on city streets, I wore it in city parks, and I wore it in the wilderness areas um, just to find out you know, what my brain waves were doing. And sometimes my brain responded predictably and sometimes it really didn't. Uh, I started out in Japan which is a country that, like many parts of the world, is facing an increased amount of urbanization, incredible amounts of stress. I think the office workers in Japan are probably the most stressed out workers on the planet. Um, there's actually a word for keeling over dead at your desk, which is something that happens there. <laughs> so the government there has really started encouraging, um, especially Tokyoites, to go out into the national forests on their high-speed trains and do forest bathing. And the word for that there is shinrin-yoku. And uh, it does not involve taking off your clothes. It's really just uh, a way to be in the forest where you're engaging all five of your senses. And there are rangers in these trails, in these forest therapy trails. They call them therapy trails. Uh, and the rangers will help you um, just be mindful in that zone. So you're listening to bird song, you're feeling the breeze on your cheek, maybe um, feeling the moss in your fingers. And at the end, uh, you can drink bark tea made from tree bark, which I don't necessarily recommend. But it's part of the idea of getting into that mindful zone. And at the same time, they're starting to measure people's physiologies in these environments. They're finding this 2% drop in blood pressure, a 4% drop in heart rate, and a 16% decrease in cortisol. And by the way, this is just after 15 minutes of forest bathing. And when I first heard about this, I was a little bit skeptical because we know that exercise right, promotes well-being, very well established to do that, helps relieve stress. But the researchers in Japan are, are 
sort of um, they're adjusting for this by by having groups of people they're controlling for it by having groups of people also spend 15 minutes walking in a cityscape, and they're really only seeing the stress reduction and well-being boosts uh, in the nature walkers. I also visited South Korea, which is actually stealing some of the researchers away from Japan. Not only do they have therapy trails, but they actually have entire healing forests now in South Korea. Um, they have about 17 of them. And in these healing forests, well, first of all, it's sort of a radical concept, because typically the forests are managed for recreation, they're managed for timber. But now in the national plan of South Korea, it's listed as a human right that people should be able to um, extract well-being from their forests, not just other resources. So I stumbled upon this group of men in one of these healing forests. And I have to say, it was really unlike any group of men that I would stumble upon in a place like Montana. Right? <laughs> so, so there were no firearms, and there were no fishing rods, and no bottles of Jack Daniels. Um, these men were actually doing partner yoga and they were rubbing lavender oil into each other's forearms, and they were making floral collages. <laughs> it turns out this group of men were actually firefighters uh, with post-traumatic stress. And I said to one of them, I was like, well, how is this working for you? They were in the woods for three days, staying in cabins, and I could just see his shoulders drop, and he sighed, and he said, I wish I could be here all the time. And they're also doing some science there. Um, this was a study comparing, again, people who were spending time in the forest compared to people who were walking in a city. And they found the 75% reduction in feelings of anger and frustration. These were sort of more qualitative tests. Uh, and, and this is one of the 500 healing rangers in South Korea woman here. Um, she's actually leading a program in downtown Seoul in a big city park, and it's for adolescents with digital addiction. So a big problem in South Korea. And, but here she is, she's working with the mothers, and they're doing kind of a leaf art. Uh, because if you have an adolescent with digital addiction, chances are you also need some stress reduction. <clears throat> and in the other photo, this sort of cracks me up because she's taking uh, an 11-year-old uh, on a hike, and it, it looks like he's about to fall into this creek, <laughs> and she's kind of holding on to him, right? And um, you know what she said to me is, "Look, you know, if we're going to be competing with video games and cell phones, we have to provide some level of risk. Like there has to be some physical risk, some physical excitement, so that these kids are engaged." and they think this is fun, um, and also that they learn to engage all of their senses. Because typically, they're in school all day long, then they're inside, playing on their devices, um, and, and in fact, their nervous systems are really sort of, um, you know, kind of corralled into this zone where they're, they're not using all of their senses, and that's a stressful place for the human brain to be. This is a program I visited in Scotland. It's called Branching Out. And it's a program for severely mentally ill patients who have just been released from institutions. And it's a 12-week program. Uh, they spend three hours at a time in the woods. And they're, they're just doing sort of fun things, like they're making fire from flint, or they're learning about edible plants or orienteering. Um, their basic hiking skills. And, and what they're finding is that it's a great transition program from institutions kind of into normal functional life. Because you're with a group of people, nature really facilitates a kind of easy social interaction, not a forced interaction. People can engage and disengage um, as they need to. And in fact, this is part of also an effort in Scotland to turn the woodlands around public housing projects, which are pervasive in places like Glasgow, where there's a lot of, um, a lot of depression, a lot of suicide, a lot of um, drug and alcohol addiction, to turn these woodlots to make them sort of friendlier for use by, by residents. And so this tree obviously has some graffiti on it, um, but this ranger now runs programs also for preschool children and for the elderly, because if you see little kids running through the woods, you feel safer going there yourself. And this is a horticulture therapy program in Denmark. Uh, it's for people with worker burnout. 
who are really too depressed and too ill to go back to work. So that's not really a phrase that we use a lot in this country, but I think we can all relate to what it means. I know I, can, I saw that hammock and I just wanted to plunge right in. Um, again, this is a 12-week program. Sometimes when, the, when people get to this program, they're so depressed that their sensory systems are sort of shut down. Their brains and their bodies are not communicating. And in fact, they don't really react. They don't really respond to the stimuli in their environment. And so when they first get there, sometimes they just lie in this hammock. Or they'll put on these big snowsuits, because this is Northern Europe, in many parts of the year it's cold. They'll put on these big snowsuits and they'll just literally lie in the woods or they'll lie in a clearing. Um, and eventually, over the course of the 12 weeks, they start to hear the breeze, they start to hear birdsong, they, they start to look at the clouds. And then they start slowly interacting with each other, they start cultivating plants, making tea from plants, um, they start working in the garden. And in fact, after 12 weeks, 60% um, of them are able to go back to work. And there's an average of 20% improvement in symptoms, which is the difference between being considered sick and not being considered sick. So it's actually, of the interventions that they do in Denmark, this has the highest success rate of any other intervention. And there's a long waiting list for this program. Uh, it's paid for by the government. So the question is, if all these great things are happening to our nervous systems, why? What are the mechanisms? Why do we feel so much better when we're outside? There are a lot of theories about this, ranging from the fractal patterns that Richard Taylor talks about in the Jackson Pollock paintings, also found in nature, um, to the color green. It's the color green. That makes us feel vitalized. Or it's the bird song, which makes us feel alert. Um, but, but really, one of the major sort of theories that people keep coming back to is this idea that's been popularized by Harvard entomologist Ed Wilson, uh, which is this, really this idea of biophilia that humans evolved in nature. We lived there for most of our existence. Um, we have a natural innate affinity for living things. And even on a subconscious level, when we go into a, a benign, pleasant, natural landscape, our brains feel like they're at home because our perceptual systems and our nervous systems evolved in concert with the natural world. So our perceptual systems want to know, that we know how to take in information from a natural landscape, and we're comfortable doing that. As opposed to you know, crossing one of the traffic circles I mentioned in Washington, D.C., um, where you're so overstimulated that, in fact, we work hard to filter out information. And that's what really all of us do in our modern urban lives. We are filtering out stimuli, which in fact is fatiguing. It uses up a lot of glycogen, a lot of glucose in our brains to do that. Um, we may not be aware of it, but by the end of the day, we're fatigued and we're grumpy. And we may not be our best selves with our family members. Um, and so, so because we're more comfortable in that space, our, our psychology relaxes, our nervous system relaxes. Uh, and if you, if you take this idea of kind of the stress-mediating effects of nature and you look at this over a large scale, large population scale, you see in these epidemiology studies real health effects of diseases that are mediated by stress. So within one kilometer of green space, in a Dutch study of 400,000 people, a lower incidence of 15 stress-related diseases. UK study of 10,000, lower mortality rates. Um, Spain, higher gestational birth weights. Um, and, and recently here at Harvard, 120,000 nurses, nurse health study, um, a 13% drop in depression and an overall, mor overall mortality drop also of 13% in those living closest to green space. And these, by the way, these are all adjusted for socioeconomic factors. Um, so it's not just that people who have more money live in green space and have better access to medical care. Um, they've really tried to adjust for that. So, um, you know, I've talked about the stress reduction effects, but if you look at children, you really start to see some of the other possible mechanisms for why being in nature makes us happier. And you look at children and you watch them outside, and what are they doing? They are exploring their world. 
they are really having that adventurous childhood that Michael Chabon talks about. This is an adventure, um, I'm oh, sorry, a forest preschool, a forest kindergarten in Scotland. Forest preschools are really common in Western and Northern Europe. About one in 10 kids attends one. And uh, what you see is that these kids are learning skills outside that they're not necessarily learning by being boxed into a classroom. So, um, uh, the, the director of this preschool in Scotland told me that when children arrive, she said some children come in and almost have what I call learned helplessness. They expect everything to be done for them. And we gradually coach them through this to develop emotional resilience and confidence in themselves. And this is something that the founder of kindergarten, Frederick Froebel, um, really intended when he invented kindergarten in the 1830s. And uh, he labeled his approach to education as self-activity. And it was really self-directed learning that children could run around and do what they wanted. Um, kids' brains really learn by exploring the natural world. That's how they evolved, and that's what they're supposed to do. And yet, we're sort of cutting children off at the knees now by putting them in these box classrooms with no windows often, and telling them exactly what to do with their crayon and their paper plate. In fact, where I live in Washington, DC, only 10% of children even go outside. 10% of children get recess in Washington, DC. And if you look across the country on any given day, only 20% of children get recess. And in fact, there's a big racial divide there. So about, on average, about 15% of white kids do not get recess. 39% of black kids are not getting recess. Um, I spoke at a school in Indianapolis last week, and I spoke to 150 sixth graders. And the first thing I said was, how many of you like to climb trees? All the hands go up. How many of you like to build snowmen? All the hands go up. How many of you like to splash around in puddles? How many of you would like to spend more time outside than you do? All the hands go up. So I asked them what some of the barriers were to that. And um, you know, one little girl said, well, I'm addicted to my smartphone. <laughs> That's very honest. Um, <laughs> the kids also said, uh, you know, I have too much homework. This is sixth grade. Um, or, you know, my parents won't let me, or my parents don't take me. Uh, and I said, well, how many of you, how, how many minutes of recess do you get? And they said, zero. The school in Indianapolis, suburban Indianapolis, zero recess, zero minutes. And um, after the talk, the principal came up to me, and I was really happy that she was in the room. And she said, well, I really, I really should think about putting recess back, but it's so hard with the school board, and blah, blah, blah. Um, and then um, a fifth grader came up to me and said that she was going to write a letter um, to her principal at a different school asking for recess. So I mean, this is what our kids are facing. I, I love this photo. Um, in this one, on the left, this is what, you know, probably three-year-old, and he's carrying around a pretty pointy branch. And no one is telling him to put the branch down, step away from the branch. <laughs> um, and in this photo, uh, this little girl is climbing pretty high up on this tree limb. And I love this because there's another, a younger little girl, and she's watching with great admiration. You know, we don't tend to think of nature as really being kind of a gender equalizing space, but it turns out that, you know, kids are getting so little exercise today, it's, it's such a huge kind of epidemic, a pandemic of inactivity, that researchers are putting accelerometers and studying the movement of preschoolers. And of course, they're finding that they're not really moving around at all. And in a conventional playground, the little boys are running around a lot more than the little girls in these kind of urban um, play spaces. But as soon as you measure this um, these accelera acceleration or movement outside in nature, the little girls are actually running around just as much. We have in this country today a bravery gap between boys and girls, and more boys self-identify as being brave than girls do. But we know from surveys and studies that women who spent more time in nature as girls 
exhibit higher self-esteem, higher self-confidence, and in fact, when they get into the workplace, they have, they're, they're closer to approaching parity on a pay scale and salary with men, which is interesting. Um, studies also show that when girls spend more time outside in nature, they have better self-image about their bodies. And we know body image is strongly correlated to depression and suicide. And in fact, suicide in girls ages 10 to 14 is the largest um, rate of increase in suicide of anyone in this country. I visited an adventure boarding school for kids with ADHD, really pretty severe symptoms of ADHD, and also kids on the autism spectrum who really can't function in a normal classroom. But in this adventure boarding school, they spend um, two weeks backpacking through Civil War battlefields, learning about history. They spend two weeks rock climbing, learning about geology. They spend two weeks um, canoeing, learning about marine biology. And in fact, some of these kids are able to go off their ADHD meds and their anxiety meds after, after this program or during the program. Uh, and it really makes you think about these kids, we have such a, there's such a neurodiversity, right, of learning styles, and yet we expect everyone to sit in a schoolroom and to learn the same way. And to make them do that, you know, we medicate them. And in fact, in lab studies, medication that we give to kids with ADHD have been shown to inhibit play. They're play-inhibiting drugs and they're exploration-inhibiting drugs. And, you know, I mean, it works. It works for homework, it works for schoolwork. But you also have to wonder what this means not just for their brains and their exploration instincts, but what it really means for the future of exploration as an idea, which is such a critical characteristic of the human species. So I've talked about um, social engagement of nature, I've talked about adventure, I've talked about stress reduction, um, but another really interesting mechanism is the idea of awe and beauty and what it means to us when we experience awe. So the, the sort of technical definition of awe is that it's an emotional response to perceptually vast stimuli that transcend current frames of reference. So in other words, it's just something that blows your mind. <laughs> and we know from studies that some really interesting things happen when our minds get blown. And this doesn't always happen in nature, right? We can experience awe um, in a cathedral or in a museum or listening to a symphony. I mean, certainly um, religions have figured this out, that when we create spaces of awe, people behave differently. Uh, and we know from studies that when people experience awe, they behave in ways that are more pro-social uh, and more generous. Uh, you know, I think this probably makes sense to us. I, I don't know, probably a lot of you saw the solar eclipse this summer, right? Um, and, and one of the things that happens is you feel really connected, not just, you know, to the larger world, but I think you also feel connected to each other and to the people around you. So in some of the studies, Researchers will show subjects pictures, even for just um, 20 seconds or 30 seconds, pictures of things like a waterfall or a whale breaching. And then they'll show other subjects pictures of a shopping mall or a freeway. And they'll give them kind of standard psychology tests. And, and what they found is that after viewing the nature photos, uh, people will give away more lottery tickets or they'll engage in stronger teamwork. And in fact, um, they'll fold more paper cranes, for example, for tsunami victims. Uh, we know that when they, uh, and sometimes that's even just for looking at, let's see, looking at these photos for six seconds, looking at photos for six seconds, that'll happen. One of my favorite research experiments was conducted by psychologist Dr. Keltner at UC California Berkeley, uh, UC Berkeley. And what he did was he sent groups of students to gaze up at a really tall stand of hardwood trees on campus for one minute. And then another group to gaze up at a tall building on campus for one minute. And in each scenario, a lab technician sort of accidentally dropped a box of pencils in front of each student and then surreptitiously counted how many pencils the students helped pick up. 
and found that the students who viewed the trees picked up statistically significantly more pencils than the students who gazed up <laughs> at the building. But you know, awe doesn't have to be grand, right? And we know this also from watching children. We can experience awe, children experience awe all the time just by watching a caterpillar or um, you know, looking at a crack in the sidewalk where there's something growing. Um, to watch the, the, the wonder of children um, is something I think we can all learn from a little bit more. And in fact, Einstein right, said the most beautiful emotion we can experience is the mysterious. And Emerson famously said that seeing beauty dissolves self, it dissolves ego. What he wrote was, standing on the bare ground, my head bathed in the blithe air and lifted into infinite space, all mean egotism vanishes. So we know that these cool things are happening to our brains and changing our behavior, but can we actually see it happening? Are there biomarkers for what's going on in our brains? And a researcher at Stanford, Greg Bratman, wondered that question. He was particularly interested in a part of the brain called the subgenual prefrontal cortex. And this is a part of the brain associated with negative thinking or rumination. Rumination is something we know is linked to depression. He wanted to know if maybe that was kind of one of the secret weapons for, for why being in nature helped us. And so he sent a group of uh, volunteers to walk along the Stanford Dish, which is an urban park. It's not a pristine wilderness by any stretch. And then another group to walk along the El Camino Real in downtown Palo Alto. He sent them out for 90 minutes. And he scanned their brains before and after the walks. And what he found is that in the urban walkers, that subgenual prefrontal cortex stayed, that the activation in that part of the brain stayed the same. But in the nature walker, something really interesting happened. And that's the activation in that part of the brain really dimmed down. And in fact, this was, um, it was confirmed by qualitative questionnaires that the subjects answered, um, in which they said, you know, I'm actually not thinking as many negative thoughts at the end of the walk as I was at the beginning of the walk. Uh, and this was in the nature walkers. So that happened after 90 minutes. Um, we know that people change behavior after one minute of looking at a tree. This researcher, a cognitive neuroscientist named David Strayer at the University of Utah, said, okay, well, what happens after three days in the wilderness? Because he knew, noticed in himself, he's a, he's a river runner and he's a backpacker, that he got his best ideas after being outside for three days. And he started to think about the, what he called the three-day effect. Uh, he decided to test outward bound backpackers before and after their trips uh, in a pilot study, and he found a 47% improvement on measures of creativity. And in fact, this was confirmed in another study of canoeists in the Boundary Waters, uh, found a 50% improvement on tests of creativity. Uh, and now, Dr. Strayer is really interested in what's going on with our brain waves. So in this photo, um, this woman is wearing one of these portable EEG caps. And I have to say, this, this photo is actually totally fabricated. This was, <laughs> this was for National Geographic. And uh, so they just found a pretty spot, right, to sit on. Uh, but <laughs> it was a nice photo. Um, but this is the real test. <laughs> This is actually a river trip going down the Green River through Lador Canyon, and I, I was just on this trip about three months ago. Um, this is a group of veterans with post-traumatic stress, uh, and, and Strayer is m monitoring their brain waves over the course of three days. He has a theory that, that he's specifically looking at part of the prefrontal cortex and what's happening to theta waves in the prefrontal cortex. Uh, he really studies attention. That's kind of his specialty, and he believes that that really what's going on, why we become more creative in nature, is that our attentional networks really shift. And so we go from kind of living in our prefrontal cortex, which is where we all live in our modern lives all day long. It's where we respond to emails and where we check off items on our to-do lists. Uh, it's our task switching parts of our brain. Um, and, and so what he thinks is that our prefrontal cortex actually also kind of just dims down. 
and the activation goes elsewhere in our brain. But we don't really know where. So the theories for that are maybe they go to parts of our brain that govern empathy, um, that govern, govern kind of long-range problem solving, long-range self-concept, uh, and creativity. This is from the um, first descent of the Green River, uh, led by John Wesley Powell. And he, in fact, was himself a veteran. He had one arm that he lost in the Civil War. All of the men on his expedition were also Civil War veterans. Uh, and they loved it. I mean, they, they wanted to go on this expedition. They knew, right, that being in the wilderness is also a place where we can recover from trauma, we can recover from grief, we can have the space and the time to think about who we are and who we want to be. And in fact, you know, throughout time, human cultures have ritualized time in the wilderness as a rite of passage where we take on the sort of mantle of responsibility into adulthood. Um, and we think about how, where we fit in and how we belong to the community at large. This is something we've really lost. And I think this photo is really neat because it's actually the same spot as that Powell photo from 150 years ago. So this is me, and I'm sitting in this meadow on Lador Canyon. I'm wearing an EEG cap. And I don't, really, I don't have results yet from my own <laughs> sort of uh, experiment, but I, the, research, the researcher did tell me that I was producing more alpha waves. And that's really the holy grail of brain wave states. That's kind of what we all want. It's, um, it's when we feel calm but alert. So when you hear poets and surfers and monks you know, kind of talking about flow states, uh, it's alpha waves they're getting. And by the way, I could not get those alpha waves wearing the EEG cap in the city parks. I wore them in Scotland, city parks, and DC city parks. I couldn't get alpha waves. I could only get alpha waves when I was in the wilderness. Um, so that's kind of interesting. Maybe that just is my brain <laughs> being picky. Um, and, and this is another one of the veterans. This is Logan on that trip. And I, I love this photo because it really shows how being in the wilderness can be kind of an antidote to PTSD. And in fact, that's how some people are starting to think of it. So when you have post-traumatic stress, um, you're hypervigilant. You um, are very overstimulated by your environment. You have flashbacks, nightmares, a lot of anxiety. It's hard to even leave your house. It's hard to be in busy public spaces. Um, you want to shut down. And yet, when you're in the wilderness, you, the opposite happens. You start to really open up. Because what you see is so beautiful. Uh, and so immediate, and you're forced in the present. So you're on a raft, and there's a rapid coming, and there's a rock in the river. There's a great bald eagle flying overhead. You know, the Milky Way comes out at night, and you want, you want to see it. You want to take it in. It was very powerful for me. I, I attended two river trips with veterans. One was an all-women's trip. And it was very powerful to watch the transformation that happened in these women and in the men on this other trip, um, where they would report that they were sleeping better, they were eating better, um, but mostly they would just start laughing and singing and wanting to engage. And in fact, when they leave these programs, there's a much higher adherence to more conventional therapies because of the social bonds that they form, because they're sort of motivated to stick with other therapies. Um, so it, they can work really well together. Uh, and some of, the, I think some of the great programs, there are a lot of nonprofits now running these programs, um, they'll actually outfit some of the participants with outdoor gear you know, so they can continue doing this. But the sad reality, or not necessarily sad, but the reality is that most of us do live in cities. So as of 2008, our species crossed a major habitat threshold where more of us live in cities than don't live in cities. And in fact, we're living in the fastest period of urban growth uh, in the history of our species. So one of the greatest challenges of the 21st century is going to be how do we provide <laughs> nature where we all are, where we live. I started to think of our allocation of nature uh, as a kind of food pyramid. So the idea of the nature pyramid was actually popularized by planner at the University of Virginia. 
And this bottom layer is really our bread and butter. It's nearby nature. We need nature where we are. And the middle of the pyramid is more sort of intentional, immersive visits to nature. So, you know, we mentioned Finland. Finland is very heavily forested. It's 80% forested. It's very flat, <laughs> but it's very forested. And people in Finland are very connected to nature, and one of the reasons that they're the happiest country on earth, and the five recesses a day. Um, but researchers there are also challenged to figure out how to address increasing levels of obesity, diabetes, um, depression, and suicide, like everywhere in the Western world. And so they have started looking at the idea of dose. Is there a daily minimum requirement in order to stay mentally healthy? And in fact, they've come up with a very specific recommendation, which is a minimum dose of five hours a month of being outside in nature. So that translates to about twice a week, um, 30 to 40 minutes a visit. And what they say, if you can get 10 hours, that's better. But if you can just get five, that's enough to actually prevent mild depression. So that's a pretty specific recommendation. And then, of course, at the top, we have you know kind of the dessert, but also important. And that's these more. Um, wilderness, more time in the wild. And some of us may only get that a couple of times in our lifetimes, um, and some of us may need it more often. But the challenge, of course, is that we still have a lot of barriers to enjoying nature at that bottom level of the pyramid where most of us live. So this is my city. This is Washington, DC. And you can see this huge decrease in tree cover um, over this period of time. And in fact, you can see poverty from space. So Northwest DC, which is the wealthier neighborhoods, still have lots of good tree cover. But everything east of Rock Creek Park, not so much. And in fact, tree cover is really important. There was a study that just came out last year, um, actually after my book came out, that found that in neighborhoods that have 20% tree cover, there is a drop, there's 50% less depression and 43% less stress in those neighborhoods. And in the neighborhoods with 30% tree cover, there's a 56% drop in anxiety. So trees are important. You're lucky in Portland that you have them. Um, but this is not necessarily the destiny of all of our cities. So I wanted to visit Singapore because I felt like this was kind of the city of the future. Singapore is the third densest city on the planet. And yet, in 25 years, despite tremendous population growth in Singapore, there's 50% more green space in Singapore now than there was 25 years ago. Uh, and they've managed to, to get this through kind of enlightened policies, really. So a million trees planted. Um, there's a policy say, stating that if you are a developer and you want to build an office building, you have to more than replace the green space that you took up. And so they do this by things like vertical gardens. And in fact, this was my hotel in downtown Singapore, and it looked like a chia plant. <laughs> It's just sprouting. And my cab driver, when he dropped me off here, he said, oh, you're so lucky. You can wake up in the morning and just start grazing. <laughs> uh, and this is an office building in Singapore. Um, it, it's a garden inside the building. So you see a lot of these um, kind of lunch areas or lounge areas that are filled with plants. People gravitate to them for lunches and for meetings. Uh, this is a, a Google building. This one's actually in Tel Aviv. Uh, and this is another one. This is a workspace in Zurich. <laughs> they call it the jungle room. <laughs> but it's not just in the fancy buildings uh, and, and the fancy hotels that you see this. Uh, Singapore is filled with worker housing. Uh, this is uh, an area where they, it's an example of how they've kind of um, unzipped these underwater canals and, and, and waterways, and then now they've opened them to daylight. They're landscaping them for bird habitat and for human usage. So, so there are now 300 kilometers of trails, hiking trails and biking trails, linking the parks in Singapore. And, and really one of the great challenges for all of us is going to be how to figure out not only how to fill our cities with spaces of awe, but how to make them accessible to everyone 
in all neighborhoods of the city. The 21st century really is our century of the city. And this project will fail if we cannot figure out how to provide access to nature for everyone. Fortunately, there are some cool examples out there. Um, this is the Tacoma Nature Center right outside of downtown Seattle. Wonderful programs in the tidal pools for kids. Uh, this is actually right outside of uh, downtown Wellington. And this is a snorkel trail. So you can pop your snorkel on <laughs> and your mask in downtown Wellington and go check out the snorkel trail. Uh, in Oregon here, you guys have Proposition 99, so cool, providing funding for every fourth or fifth grader to have a week of outdoor school. Like, yay, Oregon. <laughs> And this is where I live in Washington, D.C. This is R Rodney Stotts, who is an ex-con. And he is now um, working with adjudicated youth uh, in the Anacostia neighborhood of Washington, D.C. Really high homicide rate, de a very devastated kind of urban landscape. Uh, he's working with these youth to rehabilitate birds of prey. So here's an osprey, and um, th to me this also really represents the power of metaphor and another reason why nature is so powerful. Um, one of the kids in this program has said, these birds are doing exactly what you need to do in your life to overcome things, to soar. So the birds symbolize that for him. And this is a new wilderness area, newly designated, right outside of Los Angeles. This is the San Gabriels. Um, huge urban population now using this area more than ever before. Another bright spot in this country is the tremendous rise in parks prescription programs. So there are now about 75 parks prescription programs where doctors, especially pediatricians, are starting to prescribe time in nature to their young patients who have chronic diseases that medical schools have not trained them how to solve. So again, diabetes, obesity, um, anxiety, depression, epidemic really growing so fast in these populations. Um, and they're seeing anecdotally that their patients are doing well with this time outside. Uh, um, in, in, my, in my city, Washington, there's a doctor, Dr. Robert Czar. He's now engaged 180 doctors serving 100,000 people to sign on to a Parks Prescription Program. And what they do is they sit down with these patients. Um, they actually pull out maps of where they live, where the neighborhood parks are for them. And they'll say things like, okay, why don't you um, take your family, take your whole family every Saturday morning from 9 to 11, and maybe get off your bus two stops earlier and walk on this tree-lined street instead of this other street uh, to get the benefit of trees in your neighborhood. Uh, and, and they're trying to now to study um, kind of more qu quantitatively what those effects are. In New Zealand, a green prescription program found a 20 to 30% reduction in all-cause mortality uh, after their parks prescription program. And those effects lasted for two to three years. And that was in an adult population. So my final tips are go outside. <laughs> go often. Go alone or with friends. Bring young people with you, please. And don't forget to seek moments of awe. And to inspire that, I just wanted to end with a quote from the poet Mary Oliver, who said, my work is loving the world. Let me keep my mind on what matters, which is mostly standing still and learning to be astonished. Thank you. Thank you. Got this one working. So we have some time for some questions. If we can get the house slides up so we can see the audience. If you have a question, please raise your hand and I'll come around to as many of you as I can. I'm gonna start you with a question okay. about being outside with others. So obviously you've talked about how being outside period is great. 
is there any kind of evidence one way or the other around, should you go alone? Should you go with other people? Is there a difference? There are some studies with that. Um, we know that social engagement, like exercise, is one of the successes to happiness, right? And so um, there are walking groups, especially in England. England is like totally into their rambling societies. Um, and they know that, in fact, it, it, it is a way to prevent depression um, by walking with others. But I think it really depends what your objectives are when you're outside. So. Um, you know, I just encourage people to not only pay attention to which kind of landscapes they respond to, because also people will ask me, well, is it better to walk with trees or is it better to walk next to a coastline? I mean, there's so much variability, right? Um, so just pay attention to sort of which kinds of landscapes sing to you and also kind of what you need you know, on any given day. And sometimes it's company. Sometimes we just need company and we need, you know, a girlfriend to yak with while we're walking. And I love that. I do it all the time. But there are other times, especially when we really need stress relief, when we need stress reduction, um, or we need to solve problems, either professionally or personally, when going alone is really more effective. So I find that I crave time outside alone, um, and I also sometimes crave it uh, with my friends. So just know what you want. All right. So I grew up with recess, recess every, you know, every day at school, and you touched on this earlier about how recess is going away. Is there any type of uh, federal something that says this is a requirement, it's not a requirement, it's a state-by-state -state thing, like, well, how, where is the state of recess, and um, where are we at arguing for it or against it? Yeah, great question. Um, my understanding is that there are some recommended national guidelines, um, especially from um, the American Pediatrics Association. So we, there is a recommended sort of um, daily exercise requirement. And, and schools are generally trying to fulfill that through PE. Um, and in fact, there, there are PE programs in most schools every day. But, but recess is a whole different ball of wax. It's really um, unstructured time outside um, that where we know kids thrive. And I, I don't, I'm not aware that there are sort of national guidelines per se for recess. I think it's a state by state and even sometimes a school board by school board um, kind of requirement. So I, this is a place where I think parental activism is incredibly important. The principals are not going to do it anything differently, and the school board is not going to do anything differently until the parents really start paying attention to their kids. My kids used to say recess was their favorite subject, <laughs> you know, and they love it. Um, so I think we, you know, it's another example of where we need to really listen to the kids. And in Finland, yes, in Finland, this is so interesting. You know, Finland has the highest test scores in the world. Basically, they're always kind of in the top three or top five. Um, and what they do there is for every 45 minutes of instruction, they get 15 minutes of recess. So they keep their galoshes by the door. They run into their galoshes, they throw their coat on, they run around outside, they come back five times a day. And I said to a sixth grade teacher, I said, well, you know, how does this really work? I mean, that's a lot of time outside the classroom. And she said, really, it's the only way it works. She said, they come back in and they can sit still and they pay attention. And yet, when you, you know, when you read about, there are books written about why Finland is so successful, and you never hear that. What you hear is that the teachers are well paid, the students are well behaved, it's a culture thing. Um, you never hear that, but the teachers will tell you it's really about the recess. <laughs> Hi, thank you so much for your speech tonight. So I'm very connected to the recess idea, but more on an adult level and trying to bring it into the workplace more. So for instance, I've yeah. I, we work in an old uh, air cargo hangar building. So there's no views to the outside unless our big doors are open. So I've been engaging with my employees lately and they're like, oh, when the doors open, they say, we can see outside today. And it's like, we're looking out to the airfield, but they're so excited about it. So I'm thinking, when we can't always have that, I was gonna do some like pictures of the outdoors and bring those into the office. And then I was also thinking, whenever we take phone calls, when it's nice out in Portland, to go walk outside and just walk back and forth. But I was wondering if you have any other ideas for adult recess when you, know, <laughs> you are working so hard every day and how we can bring in brief moments of nature to kind of break up our work day. Adult recess, we all need it. 
Absolutely. Um, yeah, I mean, there are some enlightened companies that are really trying to build in uh, break spaces that are outside, um, incorporate uh, biophilia into architectural design of the workplace itself, more natural daylighting, um, even even plants. There are studies, you know, I, I told you about that study um, showing photographs of waterfalls. There are similar studies just showing that potted plants can increase people's pro-social behavior. So, I mean, I had this idea that we should start a ficus campaign for Congress. <laughs> <laughs> Like, we just all need to give our Congress people a plant, right, and put it there. And I, you know, I think walking meetings is a great idea. A lot of companies are starting to do that. Um, I, you know, I, I sort of shudder to mention Facebook, but, um, you know, there is this incredible green rooftop on that campus, and uh, people take walking meetings all the time there. But I think you know, just the idea of breaks is a really good one. It's good for our creativity. It's good for our productivity. It's good for our wellness. Take your lunch outside. Walk around the block between meetings. Um, and it may be something that, uh, oh, and an another thing that companies can do that I think is really interesting is um, service. You know, service days, service projects that are nature-based. So you know, planting things, you know, greening up schoolyards. There are ways that companies can really kind of focus some of service projects to nature. I was just thinking about this gentleman's question, and I know you mentioned there was, there was yeah. a difference you thought, you were talking about your own personal experience, that, that being in a park wasn't quite the same as being out in wilderness. But I mean, how much of this has to do with just vitamin D? Just because mm -hmm. some of those positive effects you've mentioned mm -hmm. come from just the body being able to make natural vitamin D yeah. as a result of sun exposure. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, we know that uh, vitamin D deficiency is really rampant. Uh, it's linked to a lot of problems, and, and one of them seems to be higher levels of depression. So there is something about our, our circa natural circadian rhythms. Um, we are very attuned to natural daylight. We get 100 times more lumens when we're outside than when we're inside. We sleep better when our circadian rhythms are more in sync. Um, and, and interestingly, uh, there are parts of Asia where myopia, nearsightedness, is 90% in teenagers. And, and people used to think that's because of all the close reading or the close computer work. And now they think it's linked to vitamin D, that the retina actually forms in the presence of vitamin D outside from sunlight. Uh, and the retina is misshapen because these kids are never outside. So I think vitamin D is really important. I don't know if you've done any research about this, but I was just thinking about astronauts and the International Space Station, which is the most artificial environment I can think yeah. about. Yeah. Has NASA done any work on yeah. what you need to provide space travelers so that they don't get nature withdrawals? Definitely, yes. Uh, you know, there are architects. NASA used to just be filled with engineers, and now there are architects working at NASA, and, and they are trying to figure out how to humanize those spaces, and, and nature is, is being looked at. Um, and in fact, fractal patterns are being looked at, too, specifically. Um, maybe there's a way to project fractal patterns onto the walls of the space station. But what I worry about with virtual reality is that it's very difficult to really hit all the senses. You know, we can provide visual stimulation. Maybe we can provide um, some, you know, nice um, aromatherapy. But, I, you know, living in a tin can like that for six years, I, you know, you never will feel the breeze, or you hope you don't feel the breeze. <laughs> so, so I think it's going to be a real challenge not to completely lose your mind. So a lot of what you were talking about was like being in nature in a passive way, hiking through it, um, laying down and looking at it. Your pictures showed a lot of passive interaction with it. That's how which, I like to do it. <laughs> which is me too. But my question is, in the work that you did and all the studies you looked at, was there any... Um, uh, uh, research about people being in nature with active sports like skiing or windsurfing or mountain biking where you're actually having to focus on what you're doing when you're going down the mountain bike trail or you're skiing down the... I mean, you're still in awe because you're at the top of a mountain and you look around when you're skiing, but I'm, I'm just wondering if you had any different thoughts about people who are in nature in that way. Yeah, I mean, again, I, I think that, you know, the exercise piece is huge. 
So if you're getting exercise, you're, you're doing your brain a huge favor. And I think there is a, a, a quite a large body of evidence looking at extreme sports and exercise. But I didn't focus so much on that for the book because I was more interested in, in kind of the stress reduction piece, per se. Um, so, I, so I can't, I'm not sure I can point you to a lot of studies. I know that, again, and I've looked at girls and girls' education and girls' development, and where girls are participating in adventure sports, um, it's having tremendous outcomes for them in terms of self-esteem and self-confidence. So there is kind of a neat little um, body of evidence there that I've been kind of plugged into. So yeah, it's good stuff. In terms of the benefits of being in the wilderness, you've got self-esteem, you've got more charitable actions, you've got decreases in depression. Is this research being applied to the prison system or people who are in confinement in some way? Yes, great question. In fact, in Oregon, um, there is a prison system that is running a really neat experiment. Um, and they're, they're looking at solitary confinement prisoners. Um, they're assigning half of the prisoners to an exercise room that is displaying nature videos. They're calling it the blue room. And then half of them to a kind of conventional exercise room. And what they're finding is that in the inmates who are exercising with the nature videos, um, their um, sort of um, numbers of violent incidents has gone way down. There's fewer reports of aggression and fewer sort of outbursts and a lower noise level. So they're showing that there is this calming effect. Um, and, and in fact, um, well, at first, the, the prison guards were skeptical about even putting this, these nature videos in this room. Um, but then they became so convinced after, you know, there were fewer fights that they, you know, there, there were fewer sort of le levels of aggression that they had to deal with. And now the guards are requesting nature videos of their own <laughs> in their break room because they have a very stressful job. <laughs> Hi, uh, I was just wondering, with social media being so popular, what do you have to say about completely unplugging? Is there a big difference between someone who goes on a five or 10 day backpacking, out of service excursion versus someone you know who does a local hike and is Snapchatting and Instagramming? Mm -hmm. Are you still getting the same benefit by just mm -hmm. like being out and kind of enjoying it in your own way or is... Okay. What has been studied on the that? The social media question. Yeah, there are two studies that, that I'll just mention briefly. Um, let's see. Um, one, by this cognitive neuroscientist I mentioned, Dr. David Strayer, he sent students to walk around a beautiful arboretum in Utah at Salt Lake. Uh, and he had some of them um, talking on the phone. To, they had to like call their mothers that day. <laughs> and <laughs> the moms were very happy. <laughs> They were like, what, a phone call? I never get a phone call. Um, and then the other students couldn't use their phone. And then he had them take a little test of what they saw in the Arboretum. And, and the people who were on their phones performed as badly on that test of recall as people who never took the walk at all. <laughs> so you know, there's something about being on the phone that creates blindness, really creates blindness, sort of attentional blindness. Um, and then there's another study that, sh that looked at summer camps, five-day summer camps. Um, one was a nature-based summer camp in which no technology was used, and the other was a summer camp in which kind of the normal amounts of technology were used. So kids were watching TV when they got home or whatever. Um, and what they found was in the nature kids, um, after just five days, they performed, much, they improved on tests of recognizing emotions in the faces of other people. So just five days away from their phones, they, they learned how to sort of interact more face to face, which is something that we know is a deficit, right, in, in students and college students today. So another reason to leave your phone in your back pocket, if not at home, while you're outside. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Florence. Actually, I have one more question for you. You, when we were talking backstage, you have some podcasts. I do have some podcasts. Yeah, so my first book um, was called Breasts, A Natural and Unnatural History, also an environmental history. Um, and we did an eight-part podcast, um, really an, uh, an original series for Audible, and that's available on iTunes. Uh, and, and I also did one for Outside Magazine um, last summer, an eight-part series on adventure athletes. So check them out. Thank you.
Thank you for listening. We're still trying to build an audience for the podcast, and it would be a huge help to us if you could tell your friends about us. We are on Facebook and Twitter at Cybar Podcast, which is S-C-I-B-A-R Podcast, and we'd be super grateful if you would consider posting or tweeting about us. If you're in the Pacific Northwest and would like to come to an event, our list of upcoming topics is at our website at scienceontaporwa.org, and that last part stands for Oregon and Washington. You can also find out more about the events on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at scienceontaporwa. As always, I'd like to say a big thank you to my volunteers who I affectionately call the Minions. They are Scott Fry, Chris Gowan, Sam Lauk, Rita Nigren, and Steve Perry, along with many other people. They've been helping me run these events for years, and this would not happen without them. I'd also like to say a special thank you to Amber Peoples for running things for the past few months. Finally, thank you to Jonathan Colton for letting us use his song Mandelbrot Set as our intro and outro music.